Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and, everyone. And this uh, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Ron Goose, and I'm inviting you to the FIP webinar today entitled The Distribution of Medicines and Promotion of Responsible Self-Care and Challenges. And uh, it may be morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you're located, and a big warm FIP welcome to you all. My name is Ron Goose. I will be your moderator for today's session. I was the Registrar of the College of Pharmacists in Manitoba, Canada, and I'm currently the Chair of FIP's Regulator for Regulators Forum. The Regulators Forum is, uh, began in Glasgow in 2018 at the FIP conference, or Congress, sorry. Our mission is to promote a global platform for pharmacy professional regulators for sharing best price practices among peers for emerging trends, and the needs of the profession and associated regulations, thus contributing to protection of the public and achieving optimal health outcomes through a competent, adequately regulated pharmacy profession. But at this webinar, we will have, um, we'll present to you selected findings from the FIP survey on the regulations of the distribution of medicines and pharmacy's role in supporting responsible self-care. We also focus on the role of pharmacists in relation to use of generics, as well as alternative and complementary medicines. The learning objectives for today are awareness of the importance of community pharmacists' role in self-care, identify key aspects of pharmacists' action in empowering patients for self-care, and to demonstrate possible positions of the pharmacist in the recommendation of alternative and complementary medicines. I'd like to remind you that the webinar is being recorded and live streamed by our YouTube and FIP web events website. The recording will be available at the website www.events.fip.org. And we encourage you to ask questions in the question box provided. We might miss a few things if you put your uh, questions in the chat, but uh, we'll watch those as well but certainly uh, we'll look for your questions in the question box. And you're most welcome to provide feedback at any time regarding the webinars at webinars at FIP.org. And we encourage you to look into becoming an FIP member if you're not already, and you can find information on becoming an FIP member at www.fip.org backslash membership uh, underscore registration. And you'll see all those links on your uh, screen. And if you have any additional questions, you can certainly put that into the question box or the chat and we'll follow up. Absolutely. FIP would like to thank Sanofi Consumer Healthcare for, for, for supporting this online event. And we appreciate that because it allows us to bring very important messages to members and attendees uh, at the FIP webinars. So let's get started with the presentation uh, and webinar today. You've uh, heard from me. I will be your moderator for this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're located. And our first uh, two speakers will be Gonzalo Susa Pinto and Ruben Villegas. They will present the findings from the 2020 FIP survey on the regulation of the distribution of medicines and pharmacist role in supporting self-care. I'd like to introduce you first of all to Gonzalo, and he's no stranger to us at FIP. Gonzalo Supa, Susa Pinto graduated in pharmacy from the University of Porto, Portugal in 2000. He leads the areas of development and transformation of the profession at the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP. For this role, he promotes innovation and advocates for the value of pharmaceutical professional services in the areas of responsible use of medicines, in strategies for the prevention and management of chronic non-transmissible diseases, as well as infectious diseases, including vaccination services. He, he produces publications and tools to support the work of FIP members, organizations in advancing pharmacy practice 
at the national and regional level. You'll also hear in this presentation from Ruben Viegas, and Ruben is, FI, is the FIP Practice Development Projects Coordinator. He's a pharmacist from Portugal with a master's degree in exercise and health from the Faculty of Human Kinetics in Lisbon. He's currently enrolled in a PhD program focusing on the promotion of physical activity through pharmacists. He has been involved in different associations and educational activities focusing on all areas of public health and pharmacy practice. And Gonzalo and Ruben, we look so much forward to your presentation and I will turn that over to you directly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. A pleasure to be with you on this session today. Um, so if I can have the next slide, thank you so much. So just to kick off the today's webinar, Ruben and I will be presenting some key findings and some results from a recent survey that FIP conducted uh, between early November and January 2021. Um, with, with a survey that uh, aimed at uh, identifying trends and evolution of the community pharmacy sector around the world, as well as the distribution of medicines, the regulation of community pharmacy and digital and online pharmacy operations. The, the survey was conducted in, in four languages and, and we invited a total of 137 organizations in 118 countries to participate. And we got responses from 89 organizations in 79 countries and territories. So we had a fairly good respo response rate of over two thirds of uh, in organizations that were invited. And, and the organizations uh, that, or the countries where the organizations are from that participated in this study accounted for 54% of the world's population. This, this time uh, we did not have uh, a response from China because the, 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 our, our member organization in China, the Chinese Pharmaceutical Association, uh, felt that the, the questionnaire was, uh, they could not fully express the situation and the reality of the Chinese community pharmacy sector through the questionnaire that we used in this survey. And therefore, uh, they contributed with a narrative case study that will be part of the final report from this survey that will be launched uh, in just over under a month, uh, uh, yeah, uh, around the 24th of July, which will be World uh, Self-Care Day. Uh, so we do have uh, data from China, but just not through the survey with quantitative responses. And, and this, the data that we collected from this survey will be uh, we'll, we'll use that to produce two publications. One of them is the one that I just mentioned uh, that will uh, focus on pharmacy regulation and self-care, distribution of medicines. And the other one that will be focusing specifically on online pharmacy operations and internet pharmacy operations. So uh, again, we would like to thank Sanofi Consumer Healthcare for supporting this survey and the publication, as well as this series of of two webinar, of four webinars actually uh, presenting different aspects of this research and of this study. Um, and this is the, fin the final episode of these series of four uh, um, webinars. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So just to start, we will today present some data uh, that is linked to the presentations that will come after this pre brief presentation. So with regards to the self-care uh, sector and, and, and the distribution of medicines, and also some uh, about the generics med generic medicines and the, the measures in place to promote the use of generics, but also traditional and herbal medicines at the end. So starting with um, the distribution of uh, non-prescription medicines through physical ch channels, through physical establishments. And this, this is an important um, note uh, that because as, as I said, we will be covering the distribution uh, of, of medicines through online channels in a specific um, publication. And we had two webinars uh, earlier in the year to cover those topics. So this, this is really about the physical uh, establishments. Um, so, and, and this slide in particular is about the distribution of non-prescription medicines, also called sometimes OTC medicines, but uh, mostly uh, uh, we use, we prefer the terminology non-prescription medicines. And you may remember that in 2017, uh, FIP launched a publication called uh, Pharmacy as a Gateway to Care, 
helping people towards better health. And this, this publication highlighted the concept of facilitated or advised self-medication. Uh, and rather than just simply talking about self-care or self-medication, it's really the important bit where pharmacists can make a difference. And the report said that where non-prescription medicines are purchased via a community pharmacy, uh, the, the staff there, the, the pharmacy workforce will have the opportunity, will be in a strong position to facilitate this, uh, this informed or empowered self-care and self-medication decisions by the consumers and patients. Um, because of course, if medicines are purchased at a, at a community pharmacy, there will be qualified and trained personnel that can support those decisions. So, um, but we see that around the world, there are basically three big models, uh, regulatory models in terms of the access to non-prescription medicines. You have the countries and territories where uh, non-prescription medicines are exclusively just di dispensed by community pharmacies. Uh, and that's in the lighter shade of blue on this on this slide. And then you have uh, countries and territories where these medicines may also be dispensed by other channels outside the community pharmacy, but there is a list of medicines that can only be dispensed by a pharmacy. So, and then you have a third group, uh, and those are the, the blue ones, the lighter, the, the darker blue ones. And of course you have the third group where non-prescription medicines are not exclusively dispensed at pharmacies and there is no pharmacy only list. Uh, so, and those are the countries uh, shaded in, in yellow on this map. And what we see here is that the, the, in the sample for this study that includes responses from 79 countries, you have the, the first group where, uh, where, farm, where medicines, non-prescription medicines are distributed only by community pharmacies represents around 39% of the sample. And then you have around 35% uh, that are countries that where um, there is a pharmacy only list, but they are not exclusively distributed by med, by community pharmacies. And finally, you have a third group of around 27% that are those that do not have a pharmacy only list and, and medicines can be distributed by other channels as well. But so it's roughly uh, uh, divided into three parts. And what this uh, data tells us is that although you could look at it by adding the, the, the darker blue and the yellow where that a majority of countries of around 60% um, medicines can be obtained, non-prescription medicines can be obtained in uh, outside of a community pharmacy. What we see is that the regulatory models present in around three quarters of countries, around 74%, uh, actually ensure that at least for a list of uh, medicines within, or of non-prescription medicines, at least for a list of those, if not for all, uh, the, the intervention of the pharmacist or a, a trained pharmacy technician, for example, is required to support the decisions uh, of the patient around uh, self-care uh, products. And, and then you see those two bars on the bottom part of this, of the, of this slide. That is really the comparison between this year's survey and the previous survey that we conducted, which had data from 2016. And we can only compare the, uh, the, the evolution across the countries that responded to both surveys, of course. And that's a group of 54 countries. And what we see is that the group of countries where mm, the yellow group, let's say, uh, where non-prescription medicines are not only at pharmacies and there is no pharmacy only list has remained uh, fairly stable. Let's say it has not changed in terms of uh, the number. Uh, but we see a, a, a small change in the, in the other two countries, in the other two groups, where a couple of countries have changed from uh, having all medicines, all non-prescription medicines uh, at community pharmacies to allowing other channels to distribute them as well, but keeping always a, a list of pharmacy-only uh, medicines. And maybe can I have the next slide, please? So in just to give you an overview of what other distribution channels uh, are there and, and how, how frequently uh, these are present in, in, other, in various countries. So uh, we, have, we had responses from 76 uh, countries and territories for this question. And, and, and so the, the, the main channels, the physical 
um, uh, main channels outside of community pharmacies where non-prescription medicines can be dispensed, including include druggists. And these are mostly establishments that um, uh, are manned or uh, staffed by a, a, um, um, a pharmacy technician, for example, or with an in a person with an intermediate pharmacy degree. Uh, in some countries, especially in countries with Romanesque languages, they are called parapharmacies. Um, then we have general establishments, meaning uh, supermarkets or stores that sell other, other all types of products, but also are authorized to dispense or to sell uh, non-prescription medicines. Then we have dispensing doctors, informal settings, uh, such as street markets or street vendors. And, and hospital pharmacies. And um, we see that the main, the most important channel outside of community pharmacies is uh, the outpatient dispensing service of hospital pharmacies with 50% uh, present in 50% of the sample, uh, follow, followed by the druggists or para pharmacies that are present in around 37% of the countries in this study. And, and of course, what, what, I mean, the, the sales of these of non-prescription medicines in general establishments is of some concern because the, these might imply that there is no opportunity to interact with a health professional, with anyone within the pharmacy workforce to uh, for support in, de in decisions that regards uh, non-prescription medicines. But of course, uh, of even greater concern is that the existence of nearly 16% of distribution of, of these medicines in informal settings where it is uh, very challenging to even control the, the efficacy, uh, the authenticity, uh, the, the safety of these products in addition to not having this possibility of consulting with a healthcare professional for uh, uh, supporting decisions around self-care. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then another layer of regulation that can be in place to uh, steer uh, self-care and self-medication uh, in different ways is by, for example, whether these products are available on self-selection, meaning that the patient or the consumer can directly pick the, the medicine that of their choice from a, chel uh, a shelf, sorry, uh, or whether these uh, products or medicines are mm, somehow uh, not indirect, uh, directly available or on self-selection by, by, by patients and consumers. So we have these two situations. One of the first, the, the graph on the right, on the left is for community pharmacies and the other one is for non-pharmacy channels. And for uh, community pharmacies, we see that in 35% of, of countries, all non-prescription medicines are behind the counter. Um, and then we have a, a, a hybrid situation where some medicines are behind the counter, but some are also available for self-selection. And then we have a group of 29% where all non-prescription medicines are available on, on self-selection at community pharmacies. So this also, of course, has implications in terms of the design of the space of community pharmacies, as you may imagine. Um, and, in, and, and outside of the pharmacy channels, we have, of course, uh, those channels where uh, non-prescription medicines are available outside of community pharmacies, of course, but they are not available at all for, uh, for self-selection. So they are in a cabinet or they, they need to be provided by, by um, an authorized person. And then you have the hybrid situation again. And then you have the, the, the yellow situation is of course that of, of greater concern where not only these products are not on, on uh, dispensed via community pharmacies, but they are also uh, all non-prescription medicines are, are available on for self-selection. Next slide, please. And this uh, is where I uh, give the floor uh, to Ruben for uh, uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. So uh, briefly on this piece of information, so for this uh, uh, marker, we have now the international non-proprietary name and the regulatory models for prescribing or generic substitution. So we have uh, two points. So one is when the doctor is prescribing the medicine, can prescribe uh, either the generic or the brand normally. And we also have the situation in the pharmacy where pharmacists can uh, uh, replace the medicine for a generic or do a substitution. 
So as you can see on the map, there are uh, various models for this indicator. In the blue, you see that this prescribing by international non-proprietary name is mandatory. So in some countries, the doctor needs to prescribe the INN. And then uh, this is also something that for FIP is important as it allows for people to be able uh, to choose for also for cheaper medicines and generic medicines. So it's something, it's a position that FIP is also advocating for. On the second, uh, if you see on the map, the second layer is uh, that the generic substitution by pharmacist is mandatory. So when the patient arrives to the pharmacy, it's mandatory to substitute it for uh, a generic medicine. And you can see it more on these shades of uh, gray. Um, then you have another situation. It's uh, on the lighter shades of green uh, that the, the, the generic substitution in the pharmacy is voluntary. So the pharmacist can uh, replace the, what is prescribed by a generic, but this option is not mandatory as before, and it's voluntary. Uh, on the fourth layer, on a darker green, you have that the generic substitution depends on the, on the third party payers. So it depends on, on the remuneration aspects and um, on the policy aspects behind it. And finally, you have the yellow uh, in the end where generic substitution is not allowed. So what comes in the prescription normally is exactly what is given to the patient. So for this model, we had 74. Uh, for this question, we had 74 responses. And you can see below that there are two groups. So on the, on the square on the left, uh, pharmacists may select or dispense a generic. And in a smaller box next to it, uh, pharmacists may not select a generic, which is a lower percentage. Um, as Gonzalo said, uh, for this, uh, mark, for this uh, question, we also uh, did a comparison for the continuous countries, so the countries that responded to both uh, surveys. So for this, we have 41, uh, 41 replies. And we can see that for the, for the INN prescribing as mandatory, so the blue bars, we can see that there was a decrease in this number, which is something that, uh, again, is not um, very in line with what FIP is advocating for. So it means that the, the, the prescription uh, was not, is not anymore done by INN. Of course, this doesn't mean that it's the only action that is in place for these countries because this is only one action for the, the, the promotion of use of generics, and there might be other ones. And on the same note, you can see that on the substitution in the pharmacy being voluntary, there was an increase also in this, uh, in this marker. On the next slide, you can see uh, briefly also a picture of the homeopathic and herbal traditional medicines. You can see that on the left for the homeopathic medicines, 70% uh, are dispensed in the community pharmacies, while 30% are uh, outside the community pharmacy. And on the right side, you have the herbal traditional medicines, and you can see that 81% um, is dispensed in the community pharmacies, while 19% is not. So for these groups of medicines, it's important uh, because there are different aspects in the regulatory models in the different countries. There's also uh, sometimes differences in classification and uh, categorization of these medicines. So it's important that uh, if they are dispensed in the, as Gonzalo said as well, if they are dispensed in the community pharmacy, then at least there's a, a, a trained health professional that will assist and will guide with the choices that uh, people will make with these products. And I think that's it for now. Thank you, very Thank much. you so much uh, to Congelo and uh, Ruben. Excellent presentation and uh, excellent work once again by FIP, the staff. And uh, certainly it wouldn't mean anything if the uh, FIP members were not responding to the surveys and providing that information so we can hear it in these forms of presentations. Our next speaker is Sarah Deneen Griffin. And she will speak on community pharmacy role in supporting responsible self-care and speak about the new policy in Australia. Dr. Deneen Griffin is a lecturer in health services management and leadership at the Charles Stewart University. She holds a doctor of philosophy, graduate certificate in pharmacy practice, master of pharmacy with distinction and bachelor of biomedical science. 
She completed her PhD in pharmacy practice, focusing on consumer self-care and co-design evaluation and implementation of community pharmacy services. Dr. Deneen Griffin has been a research investigator on national and international pharmacy projects. And then at the international level, she holds a number of leadership roles. She is on the editorial, she is an, an editorial board member of Pharmacy Practice, the journal, vice chair of FIP's New Generation of Pharmaceutical Sciences Group and FIP's YPG Community Pharmacy Section Liaison. At a national level, she is, sorry, at a national level, she is an active member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, New South Wales, branch committee, chair of the New South Wales Early Career Pharmacist Group, and a member of the National Self-Care Policy Advisory Group. Sarah was recently number, named the New South Wales Early Career Pharmacist of the Year, winner of the Serrani Scholarship for Future Pharmacist Leaders, and FIP's Community Pharmacy Champion for Change. That's the very good news about Sarah. Unfortunately, uh, Sarah wasn't able to join us live today, but she did prepare her presentation in a recording, and we'll present that recording for you. And the very good news, though, of all this is that she will be watching for questions and we will be able to direct questions to her. So please take a moment, should a question uh, leap to mind, put it in the question box and uh, we will get answers for you during the panel discussion um, as we proceed through the presentation today. So uh, Ruben, I'll turn that over to you to let us hear from Sarah. Thank you so much. Hello everybody and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Deneen Griffin and I am a university lecturer from Australia. Um, my PhD was focused on community pharmacy's role in self-care. So I will be presenting to you uh, today on community pharmacy's role in supporting responsible self-care, a new policy blueprint for Australia. Now, I apologise for not being able to attend in person uh, to uh, this webinar session. Uh, I've recently had a baby, so sleep is very, very precious at the moment. Uh, so uh, I have recorded my presentation for you. Now, if you do have any questions uh, at all, please feel free to email me. Uh, I will include my email address on the final slide. Um, so as we've seen previously in uh, the self-care webinar series, the term self-care has previously been defined by the World Health Organization. And there has been increased attention uh, to concepts in both research and policy over the last decade, uh, which has led to the adoption of various new terms, uh, including consumer enablement, uh, patient empowerment, engagement, and also patient activation. Self-management and self-care are also often thought of as synonymous, uh, despite self-management really relating to self-care um, of an established health condition. So in this presentation, I've used self-care as an umbrella term uh, that largely encompasses the scope of these related terms uh, and, and is intended to describe both self-care capability, which is the knowledge, skills and confidence to effectively engage in self-care as well as self-care activity, which is the health behaviours and day-to-day -day activities that constitute self-care. So as we know, um, people take care of their health in a myriad of ways, and the dynamic nature of what constitutes um, self-care has really led to the development of various conceptual models uh, or frameworks which aim to visually represent uh, the components of self-care, the role of self-care in health, and also the broader self-care environment. So on this slide uh, is the self-care matrix, which you may or may not have seen before. And this really identifies uh, four dimensions of self-care. So as you can see, we have uh, self-care activities. And these are based on the seven pillars of self-care, uh, which presents examples of common activities that constitute um, independent self-care. We then move up to self-care behaviours, and these include the beliefs, principles and practices which influence uh, somebody's motivation, health behaviours as well as self-care activity. And then we have uh, self-care context and this illustrates the broad continuum on which self-care activities occur. So you can see on 
Uh, here we have daily choices spanning all the way up to uh, major trauma. And lastly, we have uh, the self-care environment. Now, these describe the broader determinants of self-care capability and levels of self-care activity. Um, so, for example, socioeconomic status, cultural factors, as well as the health policy landscape. Uh, so, um, in 2020, the World Health Organization also released a conceptual framework for self-care. Uh, now, I won't go into detail as to what this model uh, depicts, but I think it's important to emphasize that people um, are accessing new information, products, as well as interventions uh, through pharmacies, through retail outlets, uh, through the internet or online, um, as well as following their established self-care practices. Um, and with this, I guess the importance and relevance of self-care, uh, particularly during uh, COVID uh, in, in health policy as well as healthcare systems is becoming increasingly critical. Um, so just to give you a bit of uh, context of the current policy situation in Australia, so the role of self-care in effective health promotion and management is one of the major gaps in Australia's health policy framework. There really isn't all that much evidence uh, that people who most need support with self-care and self-management are being uh, effectively targeted by existing programs. The Australian government uh, in 2019 actually released Australia's long-term national health plan. And as part of this plan, uh, both a 10-year primary health care plan as well as a national preventative health strategy were proposed and are currently being developed. And as these national strategies are being informed um, by both the experience of COVID-19, uh, as well as um, uh, currently through, through 2020 and 2021, uh, it really is a timely opportunity to acknowledge and, and really solidify a self-care's crucial place in both health policy and practice. So um, self-care really is not yet a demand-driven concept and uh, current policy is really focused on supply uh, with some limited attention which is paid to tackling poor health behaviours and supporting priority groups. However, these are really done in an unsystematic way. So in October 2020, the um, Australian Minister for Health launched uh, the Self-Care for Health and National Policy Blueprint, uh, which was produced by the Mitzel, Mitchell Institute at Victoria University. And this report really makes the case for new policy um, to promote and expand the role of self-care in the Australian health system. The report uh, was developed in collaboration with around 50 experts in health, self-care and policy from all over Australia and I was involved in a number of the expert working groups. So this blueprint really sets out a national policy approach to build self-care uh, capability as well as enhance self-care activity in all aspects of health and healthcare. And it really highlights that the benefits associated with uh, self-care cannot be achieved uh, for the whole population through a singular focus or singular lens um, on individual health behavior and lifestyle choices. So this document is really timely um, and hopefully acts as a stimulus for the Australian government to further develop its health policy in self-care, um, particularly since uh, the government has actually appointed a team of experts to develop uh, the primary health care tenure plan uh, in addition to our experiences with COVID. So presented on this slide is the overarching, I guess, long-term uh, vision, which is presented in the policy blueprint document. And there's three strategic priorities uh, which are considered essential to achieving the support of self-care as a central component of, of the health system or, or of health care. Um, so these include addressing structural health system issues to better enable self-care. Second is embedding self-care support for individuals across health services. 
And lastly, um, is promote and support informed self-care and health behaviours for all individuals. Now, um, on the left-hand side here, you can see the medium-term outcomes as well as the long-term outcomes, which are anticipated um, or I ideal uh, in this, this situation, um, and as well as the number of action areas listed under these strategic priorities. Now, these uh, action areas were developed through the expert, expert consensus process um, and review of relevant literature. Um, and so each of these action areas were really identified as essential uh, to the development of uh, effective and systematic self-care and self-care support. So the policy blueprint um, presents a total of nine priority proposals and it's represented by the jigsaw uh, here on, on the right. Um, now I'm unable to go into detail given the time frame uh, allocated to the presentation um, and, and therefore I've provided a link to the report down the bottom here for those who would like to access um, and read more. So I'm going to go into just uh, briefly the, these priority areas. So first and foremost, the report um, proposes uh, developing a national health literacy strategy. Now we know low health literacy is associated with a range of poor outcomes, and um, that may also hinder a person's ability to implement health promoting behaviours and, and follow self-care recommendations. The second priority area is investment in the development of cross-disciplinary uh, self-care core competencies uh, for all health professionals in, in education. Third is invest in, uh, investment sorry, in the development and implementation of a comprehensive health consumer engagement framework. Um, now this in, includes accountability measures uh, for consumer participation uh, in health service design, as well as delivery and policy development. Looking at the fourth priority area, um, this is the establishment of a national digital health information and resource library, um, as well as a national quality assurance framework to assess um, both the quality and credibility of uh, web-based health resources and uh, mobile health apps. The fifth priority area uh, is really uh, looking at the development and implementation of validated assessment tools. Um, and these include uh, a universal measure of individual self-care status. Secondly, a comprehensive tool for assessing uh, health services, self-care support for consumers as well as lastly, um, the appropriate evaluation and reporting mechanisms uh, to monitor self-care activity uh, over time. The sixth priority area is uh, implementation of funding and service models that support self-care. And uh, these include blended, blended funding arrangements uh, that enable and facilitate multidisciplinary primary healthcare services, uh, as well as uh, support for research and clinical practice trials uh, to inform the development of innovative service models, as well as funding and arrangement to enable self-care support and preventative care as routine and systematic components of primary healthcare delivery. The seventh priority area is the establishment of a dedicated long-term preventative health and self-care innovation and development fund. The eighth priority area uh, is establishment of a national self-care service to provide national leadership and influence system change to embed self-care in health practice. And the last priority area is um, establishing a healthing or policies approach um, that really emphasizes the prevention of disease and support for individual and community capacity uh, for engagement in self-care to improve uh, overall health or population health. So why the push for self-care? Um, as we know, self-care really needs to become standard behavior and practice in, in the community. Economic modelling, which uh, was recently undertaken, has revealed that the cost-saving potential of self-care in Australia 
is about uh, 1300 to seven and a half thousand Australian dollars per hospital patient per annum. COVID-19 really has shown how central uh, self-care is to everybody's good health. And at the moment, self-care happens because it needs to happen. And if we could formalise self-care or provide additional help, then we start to get a win-win situation whereby people's overall health improves without necessarily over-medicalising or increasing the use of uh, health services or the health system. So really now is the time for a systematic approach uh, led by a national agenda, whereby we enable shared responsibility between both government organisations, as well as health professionals, including pharmacists, uh, to tackle health inequity um, and support self-care for um, the population. So whilst, while health literacy, sorry, uh, is an essential tool towards self-care, it really is only part of the answer. And as has been demonstrated in the previous webinars in, the, in this series, uh, we know that self-care is a fundamental aspect of pharmacy practice, and it really could be better supported in health systems more broadly. So this model has been developed by myself and um, colleagues with respect to the role of the pharmacist in self-care. So we primarily think of pharmacist's role in self-care uh, in minor ailments, in triage, in facilitating self-medication processes, but it really extends beyond that. So within this figure, uh, we depict that uh, the pharmacist's role in self-care is really operationalized into four key areas, which is prevention, detection, uh, minor ailments, as well as chronic disease. Now, underpinning these four areas really is the ability of uh, pharmacists to further develop uh, consumer or carer um, health literacy. So health literacy really is consistently identified as an essential precursor um, and critical component to effective self-care. Um, and it has important implications for understanding health information, guiding health behaviours, as well as improving health outcomes. We know that community pharmacies are the most frequently visited healthcare destination in most developed countries. And community pharmacists are one of the most accessible health professionals. So pharmacists are really well placed to address and mitigate some of the health effects of uh, limited health literacy or limited self-care as really, um, as well as, sorry, promoting self-care practices and behavior change in each of these four areas. So um, lastly, I wanted to finish with some key considerations for pharmacy practice uh, with respect to the role of the pharmacist in self-care and some changes that need to take place. So first and foremost is inclusion of pharmacy in Australian self-care health policy. Second is a national health strategy, uh, which is aimed at improving health literacy using pharmacist skills as well as their knowledge. Third is research ensuring that self-care activities by pharmacists are both measured as well as evidence-based. And lastly, um, the development of a suitable funding model which is associated with self-care in pharmacy. Now, uh, for services to be sustainable, uh, they must be remunerated and also their health workforce and pharmacists um, have to be a major investment. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you for listening and have a great night. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Truly impressive uh, with your leadership Hello. and research and as an educator and most valuable information, the uh, work you're doing or Australia's doing around the blueprint and policy development is, uh, is very, very exciting. And uh, we hope to check in with you as this uh, work continues. Our next presenter is Dr. Magali Rodriguez de Bittner on the topic of empowering patients for informed self-care, providing a perspective from the Americas region. Dr. Rodriguez de Bittner is a professor, associate dean of clinical services and practice transformation a practice, uh, sorry, of clinical services and practice transformation 
and executive director of the Center of Innovative Pharmacy Solutions at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. She is also on the APHA Board of Trustees and Vice President of the Pharmaceutical Forum of the Americas. She is, coordinating, she is a coordinating expert of the Working Group in Self-Care and Self-Medication for the Americas as part of the Forum Strategic Priorities and Patient Safety Goals. Currently, she is a fellow in Population Health at the University of Maryland Health System, health system working in interprofessional value-based integrated networks. She has developed and implemented many nationally recognized pharmacist-directed medication therapy management and disease management programs. She has developed a patient self-management program in diabetes and other diseases. She has received many awards for her contribution in advancing and transforming pharmacy practice. Dr. Rodriguez de Bittner, it's over to you, and we look so very much forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron, and, and welcome to all the attendees from all over the world. Uh, we're very excited to have an opportunity with sharing with you some of our thoughts this morning. And I wanted to <clears throat> kind of put it into perspective. I've been asked to talk about our role as pharmacists in empowering patients for informed self-care and really focusing um, some of my remarks about bringing to you a little bit of perspective from the Americas. So in my presentation, I'm going to cover these major um, areas. The first one is really talk to you a little bit about the region of the Americas and some of the challenges and changes that uh, are present within the region. And I divided it in a pre-COVID, post-COVID, because as you heard Sarah and others talk about, really this pandemic has brought uh, up the, the very important need and role that pharmacists played in helping patients with self-care, especially as patients continue to seek um, their own solutions to prevent um, that they will get um, you know, the disease. Then talk a little bit about what is our role as pharmacists and what can we do? And then uh, share with you some of the action plan that the Pharmaceutical Forum of the Americas have put into place to really address self-care um, issues in the nation, uh, particularly in the region of the Americans, uh, focusing on patient safety. Next slide. So what is happening in the region of the Americas? Well, like in many other regions of the world, one of the biggest challenges that we have is the fact that uh, it's such a vast region with a lot of heterogeneity among the countries. The differences among the countries uh, include things like differences in pharmacy education and how a pharmacist train or pharmacists receive the tools and the skills to provide care, particularly in self-management, regulations among the countries about which medications could be sold without a prescription and we require a prescription are very vast and vary. And you saw in the presentation that both Gonzalo and Ruben did, where again, they showed to you that there are differences across the uh, world in terms of what are those regulations that are into place and the scope of practice. What are pharmacists allowed to do? Where are the pharmacists practice? and what opportunities they have to really uh, interact with patients. We also know that in the region and, and really worldwide, there has been an emergence of online pharmacists and, and sales by internet. So there are many of these products that are not regulated and many of these products that again, are presented challenges in patient safety, particularly related to adulterated uh, products that we know, for example, in Brazil, in Uruguay, in some parts of the America, there was a huge issue related to products that were not safe because they were adulterated. We also know that the healthcare markets and deregulation is a global issue. So we're starting to see more and more governments and countries um, deregulating um, the sale of some of these products and, and really shifting products that traditionally have required a prescription to products that don't require a prescription and can be sold um, you know, over the counter or can be sold without a prescription. 
There's lack of uniformity, and even the agencies that control these medications vary throughout the Americas. Some countries have very um, specific regulatory agencies. The example of the United States, we have the FDA, which again has a very strict control in how many of these medications are released. But we also know that there's still some uh, loopholes in the in the sense that many of the vitamins, many of the supplements, many of the alternative medicines are not controlled by the FDA. In many of the countries in the Americas also, they have been through the years, the development of commercial treaties and agreements among the countries to allow more free flow of medications and more exchange of uh, you know, health professionals. And what we see is that that have given birth to expanding free trade zones, where again, many of these regulations really have been relaxed to allow more of this trade to occur between these countries that have the treaties. This variability level of services that are provided in community pharmacies. In many of these countries, uh, maybe the presence of a pharmacist is not required by law in a community pharmacy. And patients' expectations and perceptions, again, vary depending on what country um, in the region you, you are. So in some regions, we know that access to care for many, many patients, particularly a lot of the indigenous uh, communities, really pharmacies play a tremendous role and pharmacies is the only access to care that they have, particularly in very remote areas of the region. Next slide. So the health system in the Americas really may be very similar to many of yours around the world where there's really a public and in some countries a private um, you know, insurance and private health system. Medications tend to be classified as essential medications and not essential medications. And many of these are ruled based on national formularies. Many of these national formularies follow um, a lot of the advice from the Pan American Health Organization and other agencies, where again, some products may be covered by uh, the public health system and the public uh, health coverage, but many of them may not be. Again, in community pharmacies, we don't have a consistency in what are the requirements for pharmacists to be there, what is the role of the pharmacy. So that creates a little bit of variability depending on which country you go and what are the functions at the role of the pharmacist. Um, there's also, um, in many places, a limited product availability. So there may be products that um, you can access in one country that may not be available in another country. So again, um, you see that there may be variabilities in some of these. And access to care, again, depends a lot in the public uh, system. And again, there may be limitations of what that particular uh, public health care system will cover. Next slide. So one of the things that we heard from Sarah and, and we keep hearing is how the pandemic really brought up the importance of self-care around the world. And I wanted to share with you, this was a, a, a survey that was done in Brazil in June of 2020, where again, adults were surveyed to see how some of these self-care behaviors really changed before, um, after the pandemic. And here, what it illustrates is that in some areas in the red, it means that it actually worsened and the blue means that it got better. And what we see is that some of the um, things that really uh, changed during the pandemics were things like um, physical activity, exercise, the ability of people to really follow a healthy diet. Um, again, we see that people started to seek care and started to seek uh, medications and the attention to the products, the attention to take the medicines, the attention to really focusing on self-care really deteriorated because people were worried. The mental health status really changed. So again, it illustrated how important, again, the role of the pharmacist 
Yes, in really helping patients, empowering patients to take in appropriate decisions. Um, and it's, I believe this is going to really continue post pandemic, where patients have seen what important role pharmacists have had in many countries, and how again we can play a very vital role in guiding our patients and empowering them. Next slide. I, I couldn't pass the opportunity to, to highlight that within the American region, the US really has a, a big influence in some of the tendencies that we see in, in self-care and the tendencies we see really in regulations. And I wanted to highlight this whole movement in the United States to switch medications from prescription to non-prescription. And what we see is that this is becoming more and more common and it's usually driven by two things. One is data driven that these medications have been in the market for a long time. They have shown safety and efficacy, but also it's the consumer's behaviors and the consumer's pressure to make some of these products to be without a prescription. We've seen a lot of changes in antihistamines, nicotine replacements, and others. And again, the role of the pharmacist in educating, um, really providing guidance to patients really becomes very important as well as screening to make sure these medications are appropriate for the patients. Next slide. We also see that in many um, states within uh, the United States, we started to see changes in the scope of practice and regulations, where again, in some states, pharmacists are allowed to actually initiate treatment for final conditions, and again, based on a particular formulary. States like, for example, Florida in the United States, pharmacists now can actually prescribe certain medications that are within the formulary, again, expanding the role of the pharmacist in helping patients gain access to medications and self-care. Next slide. So when we think about what is the role of the pharmacist, how, what is our role in empowering patients to make appropriate decisions and safe self-care? I wanted to highlight and call your attention to a publication that actually was done. It was a 2019 joint statement of policy by FIP and the Global Self-Care Federation, where really outlines very nicely what are the responsibilities and the roles of the pharmacist as well as what are the role and responsibilities of regulatory agencies. So I really encourage you, I don't have time to go over all of this, but I encourage you to look at this document because it really very nicely highlights what an important role we have in educating our patients, advocating, but helping them in making appropriate decisions. Next slide. So one of the things that I keep hearing when we talk about pharmacists and their engagement in uh, advising patients in self-care is the uh, fear that some pharmacists have about what is the risk to the pharmacist if you're making recommendations? What is the risk if you make a recommendations and something happens to the patients? Or what is your risk if you miss something critical and the patient uses uh, self-medication and in fact needed further care? So I wanted to highlight here for you some of the advice that I have. One is as much as you can doing the console in person because that will give you the opportunity to interview the patient using tools tools that have been validated, like the Quest Scholar, where it systematically guides you to how to ask the questions, what to ask the patient, what to address, so you won't miss any key important factors, using the drug fact label, and when in doubt, when you don't feel comfortable, refer, refer, to for, refer. If you don't feel comfortable that that particular condition could be treated with self-medication, then it's always safe to refer to another healthcare provider and documenting, having systems, even within your electronic record or others, to document your interview, document your assessment, and document your recommendations and interventions. Next slide. 
So I wanted to share with you, so understanding how important self-care is and understanding how we need to really emphasize the role of the pharmacist and educate not only the pharmacist, the patient, but also regulatory agencies and governments. The uh, Pharmaceutical Forum of the Americas has actually um, developed a collaboration and we have developed what is called a work group of experts. So this is a technical work group that is going to really be looking into this whole issue of self-care and patient safety with two main goals. One is we have created a collaboration with an organization that is the Latin American Association of Responsible Self-Care, ILAR, and the forum to really work together in developing joint activities that will uh, aim at enhancing the role of pharmacists in self-care and really address it throughout all Latin America and the uh, region of the Americas. And understanding that more and more, the, there's a growing need to integrate the pharmacists within the interprofessional teams and understanding what I have been saying about how the post-pandemic scenario has highlighted the pharmacist, the pharmacist's role and the need that we have to really engage in being partners with our patients and encouraging self-care. And so what we are attempting to do, next slide, is realize through this work group a series of activities that this technical group will put into place within the next um, you know, 12 months. And the first thing that we're gonna be doing is really looking at the literature, emphasizing what is the literature say about the region of the Americas and what has been going on, conduct a call for proposals, Again, asking pharmacists to propose ideas, innovative ideas of how we uh, elevate and how we engage pharmacists and patients in self-care and really other stakeholders, including um, pharmacy organizations, as well as governments and regulatory agencies, conduct a series of educational activities for pharmacists and patients prepare educational materials that can be used in the pharmacies or can be used actually maybe in the media, um, in other uh, media campaigns and really publishing these findings and recommendations. So again, through these 12 months, these are the series of activities we're planning to do with a culmination of really developing, hopefully something similar to what Australia did, which is proposing that there is a health plan uh, for these countries to highlight self-care, but also the role of the pharmacist. Next slide. And with that, I thank you uh, for your attention. And again, any questions that you may have, please post in the chat. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rodriguez de Bittner. Very important information. And that regulatory uh, oversight uh, is important for access and uh, safe self-care on a global basis. And I think you brought that message to us. And also your thoughts on the prescription to non-prescription switch and the importance of labeling and the role of the pharmacist in that process. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Our final presentation before we move into the panel discussion, and I'll remind you to put your questions in the question box and we will get to them at the uh, panel discussion and question and answer session. But before we get there, we do have a presentation from Mr. Benjamin Kawami Bute. He will speak on the alternative and complementary medicines with reference to the position and role of community pharmacists. Pharmacist Benjamin Kawami Bote is the president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana and a world renowned expert on medicine regulations, quality assurance, pharmaceutical sector, and pharmaceutical sector management. He also has wide experience in strategic management and public administration. Mr. Botwe has served for the past 27 years at a very high level in public services of Ghana and Africa. He is the foundation deputy chief executive drug divisions of the Ghana Food and Drugs Board, and now it's called the authority, and acted as the chief executive from October 2001 to May 2002 during which period several regulatory innovations were initiated 
resulting in the board hitting the first $1 million in its accounts as a public service institution. So let us welcome uh, Benjamin, and we look forward to your presentation and turning the mic over to you now. All the best, sir. Thank you, Roland, and uh, thank you, panel members, and uh, also a big thank you to all the participants from around the world. And um, I'm very excited to be here to be speaking on complementary and alternative medicines, uh, the position and role of the pharmacists. And I think during the presentation of uh, Gonzalo and Rubin, uh, they made us to understand that in many countries, uh, about 81% of these products are dispensed from pharmacies. And, and, and in Ghana, uh, I think we belong to this, this particular group. Next slide, please. Um, so in, in this presentation, we will just be looking at a few uh, definitions of CAMS, the traditional medicine, and then also how complementary alternative medicines are classified. Uh, we look at a national perspective, I mean, the Ghanaian perspective to complementary and alternative medicines, and what has inspired the use of these products and why people utilize them in this country. Uh, the products that are available on the market and why pharmacists stock them and the challenges to healthcare and pharmacists in uh, dispensing and advising on, on, on these products. And finally, look at the position and role of community pharmacists in, in dealing with complementary or alternative medicines. So as we, we might all know, in, 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 there's no universally accepted definition for complementary or alternative medicines but they are described as a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems or practices or products uh, that are currently not considered as part of our conventional healthcare system, uh, uh, mainstream allopathic medicine system. Uh, complementary medicines, of course, refers to those uh, that are not in the mainstream uh, uh, together with uh, conventional medicines, but alternative medicines now are those uh, that are not in the mainstream practices, but uh, they are used uh, instead of the conventional medicine. So uh, they, they, they are complementary to that. Uh, what is considered complementary and alternative medicine may differ from country to country and also from time to time. And therefore every country has, has had to set up regulatory systems and, and availability programs for, for complementary and alternative systems. Next slide, please. So broadly, there, there is a classification uh, of these complementary medicines. Um, one group belonging to the uh, uh, biologicals, uh, these are the diets, the herbs, the vitamins. Uh, those complementary uh, uh, medical practices that, that use manipulative, uh, body manipulative systems, and like massage, osteopathy, and chiropr chiropractic practices. Uh, those that use the, the, the strength of the mind, yoga, imagery, med meditation, and spirituality, uh, those that, that are alternative systems, Ayurveda, particularly in the, in the Middle and Far East, homeopathy in Europe and elsewhere, and traditional Chinese medicine, and of course, traditional African medicines as well. And then those that use some field, some magnetic force and energies, uh, like bioforce and magnetic uh, King Kong and so on. Next slide, please. Again, there's another way that uh, complementary alternative medicines have been classified. Uh, and here in, in our presentation, we would concentrate on the, the second classification, which are the products and resources. And these are those that include herbs, supplements, essential oils and brocations, uh, manuals that people have, or have to study books that advise on various ways to handle complementary alternative medicines and then uh, the, the uh, instructional materials. So, and, and uh, another group is the self-directed practice. Next slide, please. So the perspective in Ghana, uh, typically our health concept is integral and it, is, it involves social, cultural, and spiritual values. So when people report any medication, you don't just look at the physical issues, but you look at the social issues concerning the person, the cultural issues, and of course, some uh, spiritual uh, values. And, and, and uh, that is where traditional medicines play a major role here. Uh, 
And it is known that about 70% of Ghanaians depend on traditional medicines or government uh, uh, alternative medicines uh, for primary health care. The first thing that they will do, uh, especially in typical villages, is to go and see the traditional herbalist uh, for first, uh, 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 some form of first aid and uh, uh, do other practices that may be phytotherapy or, or spiritual things in order to achieve healing. Um, there are also common, other common practices uh, in Ghanaian traditional medicines which involve bone setters. And, and in this country, there are very well-known bone setters uh, who, who are documented. And there are also traditional birth attendants who are traditional midwives, if you will call them this way, uh, traditional circumcisors. And I, I can say that for people be, beyond the age of 60 and so on, most of them were circumcised by traditional people. Uh, there are the others too who are spiritualists uh, invoking various spirits for treatment. And the most popular amongst all these is the traditional herbalists. These are people who pick herbs and either use single herbs or multiple or combination of herbs to treat various types of diseases, particularly uh, chronic diseases. And, and these employ uh, only herb, herb, herbs uh, in, in treatment. Uh, in recent times, a number of exotic complementary alternative medicines uh, modalities have been imported into the country. Uh, we have uh, chiropractic practices uh, in the country now, osteopathy, acupuncture, acupressure, homeopathy, and naturopathy. These are all new uh, things that have come up and, and they are going on in the country. Next slide, please. So, what has inspired the use of traditional medicine and complementary and alternative medicines in Ghana? Again, it has, it has a long history and uh, the very first president post-independence uh, encouraged all psychic and traditional healers to come into an association uh, so that they can be sort of monitored, they can be educated, they can be encouraged to, to continue with the practice and modify them. Then came in 1975, the establishment of what was then known as the Center for Scientific Research into Plant Medicine, now the Plant Medicine Research Center, and which has been uh, investigating plant medicines, trying to isolate components, and also uh, trying to liaise with industry to turn this research into uh, proper dosage forms for use. So since 1975, this has been going on. In the Ministry of Health of Ghana today, there is a full directorate for traditional and alternative medicines. And that is coordinating both the practice and to some extent the products. Uh, I must say that the products are regulated by the Ghana Food and Drugs Authority. Um, in 2001, the school, the pharma, pharmacy, uh, Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences of the uh, College of Health Sciences in the Common Common University of Science and Technology uh, started the training of uh, uh, students for Bachelor of Science in Herbal Medicine. Uh, to improve on the knowledge about the practice of herbal medicine and also uh, research into that area. Um, in 2010, the government set up the Traditional Medicines Practice Council, uh, which is regulating the practices of all people who are involved in one way or, or, or the other, a complementary alternative or traditional med medical practice in Ghana. Then in 2012, uh, the herbal medicine practice was fully integrated in the healthcare system, where all Ghana health service institutions, starting with 18 of them, 18 hospitals, uh, were requested to set up departments for herbal medicine uh, that, that is ongoing and is being uh, scaled up. Next slide, please. So why do patients utilize this? Again, uh, um, through promotion and, and, and prevention. People think that uh, they can use traditional and alternative medicines to prevent various illnesses and also lead healthier lifestyle, particularly the areas of diet and exercise and so on. Then disaffection with conventional treatment and services. When people have been on medications, particularly for chronic diseases over a long period of time, uh, they tend to tend to uh, traditional and complementary and uh, alternative medicines. And uh, they have been seen to be helpful in, in some situations. Again, we all know, I mean, and, and I think uh, it's not only in Ghana that uh, people think that these are natural products and therefore they are safe and devoid of side effects. 
so they tend to uh, uh, gravitate towards that. The other thing is also that they are accessible, they are available, they, they are affordable. Uh, and let me say that in recent times, they are no more that uh, affordable because um, they are getting more expensive with time. Maybe with research going on a new packaging and new regulatory requirements, uh, these, these uh, uh, products are becoming more expensive from time to time. Again, I've said already that the social culture and spiritual values also tend to encourage people to use this product. But important is the role of the media, uh, where advertisements are, are ongoing in, on various uh, media platforms uh, and online sales and so on, are also making people gravitate towards traditional and conventional alternative medicines. Next slide, please. So some of the common uh, medicines, traditional medicines that are available on the Ghanaian market include herbs, uh, those that are local or imported. And these present themselves in various uh, dosage forms, either as tablets or capsules or, or liquids uh, and, and so on. Uh, they are very available on the Ghanaian market. There are a number of supplements uh, and they, they, they are meant to be taken alongside other medications that are taken. Obviously, we are here to study the type of interactions that are likely to exist between these. Uh, functional foods are available, traditional functional foods, nutraceuticals, some vitamins, various diets. And in recent time, Ayurveda medicines are coming in from particularly India, and then homeopathic medicines as well from Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and homeopathic hospitals are being set up and their products are also available. T traditional Chinese medicines have also found their way into the market. A number of essential oils and embrocations and self-help manuals and some books and, and instructional material that people will have to read uh, in order to, to get healed in, in a number of ways. Next slide. So why do pharmacies stock these products? Uh, as I said, the university, uh, Common Chroma University of Science and Technology is training uh, people in, in herbal medicine, you call them medical herbalists, and these people are, are prescribing herbal medicines. And some medical practitioners are also prescribing herbal medicine, and therefore pharmacists would have become interested and are stocking them and, and, and dispensing them. Uh, patients with chronic conditions, like I said earlier, tend to, to depend on these, and they come asking for, and therefore the pharmacists stock them and educate them on how they should be taken and, and also report any ad adverse effects or report back to their doctors if they have any issues. I dare say that uh, for a long time now, uh, maybe from the mid seventies or so, the Ghana, they have been regulation of, of, of uh, traditional alternative medicines. And this, this further intensified with the establishment of the Ghana Food and Drug Board, which is our authority. And, and therefore there's a certain level of confidence in the products and, and pharmacists are stocking them for use. And uh, again, we have heard from the various presentations from the Americas and from, the, from Australia that uh, community pharmacies are geographically accessible, accessible and, 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 and pharmacies, pharmacies are easily approachable and therefore people tend to rely on what they find in pharmacies and therefore they need to stock them. But I should also say that there is currently improved packaging uh, labeling and product information on, on traditional medicines. And uh, there's information to read and understand and, and make some professional judgment out of them. And finally, the, again, the, the, the role of the media is, is, is also another thing that uh, brings pharmacies to stock complementary and alternative medicines. Next slide, please. So there are a few challenges moving forward for the whole, the whole healthcare system and community pharmacies in particular. Uh, there is lack of education and understanding and obviously some inherent biases towards uh, mainstream practices. This, these are things that draw uh, community pharmacies back. Uh, integration of traditional medicine into mainstream practice and the lack of col uh, collaboration between various practitioners in, in the uh, complementary and, and uh, alternative medical practices, as well as the current allopathic medical practices that we have in the country. Then the issue of patients combining complementary alternative medicines and the allopathic medicines they are, they are taking 
it's, it's a big issue. And these are not usually reported to their healthcare pra uh, practitioners, to, to, to their doctors and pharmacists, and people get uh, some complications uh, along the line. The poor regulatory framework uh, for, for these, including uh, uh, calm interventions from the mainstream adverse event reporting schemes. Uh, uh, in recent times, um, efforts have been made to add to the reporting formats from the FDA in the pharmacovigilance system of uh, adverse events following the use of, of traditional alternative medicines. And, and this, is, this is an improvement. Then the, also the widespread perception that complementary alternative medicines are safe and natural. Uh, this is this is omnibus, but we think that uh, uh, not everything is that safe, and therefore we need to open our eyes towards that. Then the complexity of uh, traditional medicines therapies and their interactions uh, between them and the conventional care uh, is, is is something that that's something that is to be to be dealt with. On the other hand, there is also the professional complacency where discussion of safety and efficacy of traditional and complementary medicines uh, can be misinterpreted by the practitioners as an, an, an approach to disrespect the system and the practice and the products instead of rather assisting in further research and development and, and also promotion of these products to obtain better health for, for, for all the people. Next slide, please. So the position of uh, and the role of the pharmacist uh, uh, there's evidence that most pharmacists support the idea to integrate these two systems, uh, uh, complementary alternative practice and allopathic practice. And to achieve this, uh, the knowledge base of all healthcare professionals will have to be improved, uh, particularly in addressing the issues of safety, quality, and regulation. And this must be evidence-based. All those practices must be evidence-based. Uh, community pharmacists are often considered as first contact points. And therefore, the uh, community farmers are perceived to be accessible and trustworthy. And therefore, patients uh, get there to contact them all the time. And therefore, there's a the need for information base and then also for uh, some research and, and information that will assist community farmers to be able to advise properly on the use of these medications. Uh, community farmers are ideally situated. Uh, and therefore can be used as health promotion and campaign services, uh, including the promotion of the safety and efficacy of complementary and alternative medicines. Next slide, please. So the main responsibility of the farmers with regards to traditional and alternative medicines include that um, it must be acknowledged that these products are used very widely. Uh, in this country, like I said, over 70% of people use them. Uh, Note the evidence-based recommendations from the common traditional and alternative medicines that are used among patients. And in Ghana, uh, there are particular products uh, that, that, that have been used over time, over the years, and therefore uh, pharmacists have built some uh, knowledge base on them and are, are helping customers with them. And also ensure that patients adhere, ad, uh, adhere to the safe use of these complementary medicines use them appropriately, uh, use them uh, not in combination with other products that should, they should not be combined with particularly uh, uh, allopathic medicines and also inform their healthcare practitioners if they use them. Pharmacists are in a position to ensure that these things are done. Then also to document any reports of side effects or adverse effects uh, that patients bring into the pharmacies uh, on the use of complementary alternative medicine and to contribute to the heightening of awareness and education about complementary and alternative medicines since they are readily available and they are always approached. Pharmacists, again, will have to co collaborate with other healthcare professionals to ensure the safety and efficacy of traditional and, and alternative medicines. But I must conclude by saying that there's a need, especially in this era, for guidelines to be, to be developed and uh, uh, implemented to assist pharmacists to make evidence-based evidence decisions on complementary and alternative uh, medicines uh, in traditional medicines for that matter. Next slide. So I want to thank everybody for, for listening. There are a few uh, references that uh, we can refer to for, for further study. And I'm grateful 
for the opportunity to speak to you and I'll stand by for any questions that will come. Thank you very much. Ronald? Thank you very much, uh, Ben. I appreciate your uh, presentation. And uh, once again, appreciate the presentations of all. You certainly have raised uh, our awareness around uh, complementary and alternative medicines. And also the issue about the overall safety profiles of these products and the public perception of the safety of the profile of these products and how these would fit into the role of the practice of community pharmacy and meeting the needs of patients and the necessary uh, review uh, of perhaps global standards around the use of these products. So we're getting close to the half hour and our time is scheduled to stop at the half hour, but we do have a few moments for questions. The question box is filling up a bit. Uh, I would like to uh, start off by uh, asking the question and I think it would be going to uh, Magali, what could be the role of the pharmacist in collecting, and I believe the abbreviations refer to data around non-prescription medications. Should this be intermediated through associations in collaboration with academia? Would you be able to answer that for us? I'm gonna try. <laughs> um, so what we've seen is there have been a movement, particularly in the United States, but it's called post-marketing surveillance. Most of that has been limited to prescription meds, medications, where again, pharmacists have an ability in an online system that the FDA has to report adverse events, right, that, that prescription medicines have. But the question is, could these be expanded to non-prescription medications in a, in a way to really capture, particularly, um, there's a lot of interest in these prescription that have been switched to non-prescription and cannot, you know, follow and see what's happening with an increased use of these agents. So the answer is, is yes, it could be, it could be through an association or it could be with the regulatory agencies and using some type of online system. Very helpful. Thank you. And I think post-marketing surveillance on all medications uh, pose a bit of a challenge, especially if, uh, reporting that information back to, uh, databases and sources. Anybody else on the panel wish to uh, contribute to the answer on this? Okay, I will move on. I believe this one is for you, Ben. Uh, regarding the use of herbal and traditional medicines and given that people use it concomitantly with allopathic products, is there official continuous research on interactions between these two types of therapies? Uh, yes, yes. Um, the, the, there is there, there are a number of researches uh, going on. Um, what what is happening is that sometimes people use resort to traditional alternative medicines when they feel that they have had enough of, of allopathic medicines. Sometimes they try to also combine the two, and this is where um, further studies are required to see look what what happens in terms of drug drug interactions. And, and so on and so forth. So uh, research is still going on. And I think this is one, one area uh, that uh, academia could pick up to, to, to see where, 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 where we can reach with this. Again, uh, traditional med medical practice, uh, medicine pro products themselves are still being researched into to sort of establish uh, the effects uh, over you know, long-term use of these products and not just the the, the episodal uh, use of these products that, that may not show any, any particular side effects at a particular time. Thank you so much for that. Uh, one of the questions we had early on, and maybe uh, Gonzalo or Ruben can answer, in your research, there was a question about oversight and inspections and any, uh, anything came out of your research at the time as to who would be the responsible body to ensure where there is restricted access for some of the non-prescription medications can only be sold in certain locations, such as a pharmacy, who maintains that oversight and the enforcement? Was there anything in your research that gave us an, an answer to that? Um, thank you, Ron. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Yes, we did ask about the, exist, uh, yeah, the existence of a quality assurance systems, uh, which normally consist of inspections by a regulatory authority that, um, assesses the quality of practice uh, and namely access to medicines in that in that case uh, against 
agreed and standard criteria that could be based on good pharmacy practice criteria, but other, other criteria as well. We did ask about that and that will be included in the report that we will be publishing in a, in a few weeks. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have the, the data and it from the top of my mind now, but, but it will be part of the publication that we will issue very soon. Well, you've intrigued us and whetted our appetite for the report that comes out. So that was very, very tricky of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, we are down to the very last minute. There are some questions. We will get to those questions. I know uh, some of the staff have uh, answered some of those questions online, but I don't want to keep people longer than we've committed to. So I would like to close this. Uh, it's been very, very informative. Expert panelists speaking on this subject. FIP, great job in organizing and making guys like me look like I know what I'm doing. But more importantly, uh, Sanofi Consumer Healthcare for supporting this event. Very informative well-presented seminar. This webinar has been taped and uh, it will be available through the FIP website, as I understand it. I wish you all the very best of the rest of your day, evening, or maybe morning. Uh, and please go to the web FIP website to see the coming presentations uh, and encourage your attendance and participation. Thank you very much, merci and miigwech. Bye for now. Thank you very much.